I begin with my last volume then, which was called The Oracle in the Heart, and published in 1978. Indeed, there are some copies of it here. Uh, it is still in print. I think it's the only one of my books that is still available, except this collected poems. Into what pattern, into what music have the spheres whirled us, of travelling light upon spindles of the stars wound us, the great winds upon the hills and in hollows swirled us, into what currents the hollow waves and crested waters, molten veins of ancestral rock wrought us, in the caves, in the graves entangled the deep roots of us, into what vesture of memories earth layer upon layer enswathed us of the ever-changing faces and phases of the moon to be born, reborn, upborn of sun-spun days our arrivals assigned us, our times and our places sanctuaries for all love's meetings and partings, departings, healings and woundings and weepings and transfigurations. I think, if you don't mind, this chair is much too comfortable. It's an excellent chair to go to sleep in, but I'm going to stand up. It's all right. I, I, I like standing, and I think you'll also probably hear better at the end. This is a poem called Columbines. Finding in a friend's garden Columbines. It was as if they were those my mother grew, and above all, those colored like a shell of rosy pearl seemed hers, returned in all their freshness from her garden to remind me of it should have been happy days when I was sheltered by her love and shared her flowers. But by the vague, bitter sorrow that arose out of the shadowy present of the past, I knew that it had not been so. Willful and unloving had been the daughter my mother made, and all her flowers in vain offering her life to mine. What did I hope to find when I turned away from her towards a cold future, now my sum of years, from the unprized only love earth had for me, Demeter's, for her lost Persephone. This is a, a, a sequence of poems called Monesi Gorge. It's on the way to Canada, so perhaps Ian Smith will regard it as being halfway there. My mother w w was a Scot, I may say, but I never myself lived in Scotland. Seen from the train, brown, brown water, swift bubbles of foam. And as I pass, I am that stream, am one with the continuous, swept on my course, the pouring river in its shelving gorge, forever wearing its rocks away. The second poem. Live on in me, remembered one. I am your future and your memory, who within this ever-moving now, at rest in change, wore, as I wear, the seamless dress of earth and sea and sky, one in the long unbroken flow, we who have been, are one another forever, whose voices to the stars must cry and cry in sorrow and in ecstasy, I am. Third poem. I am the stream, I said, and yet not I the seer, the running water, the joy unbounded. 
It crossed my mind that death might be like this opening, this boundless coming forth to say, this river is I, to extend suddenly like air, to be everywhere like sky beyond vault of cloud, lot not less myself, but more than I. Yet I had lost my situation in time and place, and wondered after who it was who had been when I said in fleeting joy, I am the river. Returning from church, it's the painting by Samuel Palmer. That country spire, Samuel Palmer knew what world they entered, who kneeling in English village pew were near those angels whose golden effigies looked down from Gothic vault or hammer beam. Grave, sweet ancestral faces beheld Sunday by Sunday, a holy place, few find who, pausing now in empty churches, cannot guess at those deep, simple states of grace. I often think how true Lawrence spoke when he said, knowledge is not a formula, it's an experience. And I think conceptual knowledge has become something so like a formula that it's almost indistinguishable from a computer. But one must remember that human knowledge is always an experience. And imaginative knowledge is an experience. Um, and there are many experiences which our ideologies have, as it were, shorn us of there are things we can no longer experience because of the, uh, as it were, formation of our minds according to the uh, present world, or indeed that would be true at any time. This is a poem called Campanula. This morning waking, but not yet remembering it was I who saw in my window white campanula stars against white mistiness, curving like a shining hill against the panes, remembered or discerned a way of being those immaculate flowers were part of once, some house of elegance and kindness where I had been, it seemed, or still remained, until the day opened the present, and closed that other time and place the flowers lingered in a little longer than I. Another decade it had been, or another life, whose ways were fine and clear as these white visitants from a house of presences forgotten. This is a poem called Me Dear. I'd been rereading Gilbert Murray's translation of the Me Dear. A liberated woman, I suppose. Anguish and revenge made visible, her serpents lifted Me Dear above pity and horror of the enacted crime. Murderous to herself, most cruel, absolute in power of absolute loss, invulnerable by human justice or human hate, Apollo whose ancestral fire seethed in her veins, snatched among the gods who acknowledge only the truth of life, fulfilled in her to the last bitter blood drop of her being. On Amphora and Crater, Apotheosis has raised into the myths of Greece the barbarous wronged woman whose outstretched parting hand warns that there are furies among the immortals, that anguish is an avenging frenzy of passionate love that slaughters her own children. What could earthbound Jason, who rated calculation above the gods, answer Medea departing on the dragon chariot 
of her desolation. Well, moving back to the volume before, these are three poems I wrote at the time of my mother's death. She lived to 93 with me in her last years. With a wave of her old hand, she put her past away, ninety years astray in time's fading land. With that dismissive gesture, threw off pre pretense, rose to her proud stature, had done with world's ways, had done with words, closed her last written book to ponder deeper themes in unrecorded dreams. Then the leaf. I think it's one of the things of old age that you live continually more in the present and you notice things more. I begin to notice this myself. How beautifully it falls, you see it, as a leaf turned and twirled on invisible wind upheld, how airily to ground prolongs its flight. You, for a leaf fall, forgot old age, loneliness, body's weary frame, crippled hands, failing sense, unkind world and its pain. What did that small leaf sign to you, troth its gold plight, twixt you and what unseen messenger to the heart from a fair, simple land? This is also owed to my mother. Your gift of life was idleness as you would set day's task aside to marvel at an opening bud, quivering leaf, or spider's veil on dewy grass in morning spread. These were your wandering thoughts that strayed across the ever-changing mind of airy sky and travelling cloud, the harebell and the heather hill, world without end, where you could lose memory, identity and name and all that you beheld became insect wing and net of stars or silver glistering wind-borne seed forever drifting free from time. What has unbounded life to do with body's grave and body's womb, span of life and little room? Then this is a more profound um, some of you may know the Kabbalistic tree of God with the, with the ten sephiroth or spirits of God aspects as it were of creation and the highest feminine principle is called Bina she is not Malkuth who is the earth paradise nor Netzach who is uh, Venus, if you like, she is something, she is the very principle, the first principle of, of the feminine aspect of the diversification of, of, of deity. There is Ketha, the crown, then there's Hochmar, who is energy, and Bina, if you like, who is the, 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 yin, the yin, the yang, the yin. Lifelong the way. I never thought to reach her throne in darkness hidden, starless night, her never lifted veil. Too far from what I am, that source, sacred, secret from day. But suddenly weeping, remembered myself in her embrace, in her embrace, who was my own mother, my own mother in whose womb human I became. Not far I found, but near and simple as life, 
loved in the beginning beyond praise your mothering of me in flesh and blood. Deep her night, but never strange, who bore me out of the kind animal dark, where safe I lay, heart to heart beat, as myself your stream of life, carrying me to the world. Remote your being as the Milky Way, yet fragrance not of temple incense nor symbolic rose comforted me, but your own, whose soft breasts, nipples of earth, sustained me mortal in your everlasting arms. Known to the unborn, to live is to forget you are all, whose unseen sorrowing face is a farewell, forgotten forgiver of forgetfulness. Lifelong we seek that longed for, unremembered place. This poem is called Turner's Seas. <coughs> we call them beautiful, Turner's appalling seas, shipwreck and deluge, where man's contraptions, mossed and hull, lurch, capsize, shatter to driftwood in the whelming surge and swell, men and women like spindrift hurled in spray, and no survivors in those sliding, glassy graves. Doomed seafarers on unfathomed waters, we yet call beautiful those gleaming gulfs that break in foam, beautiful the storm-foreboding skies, the lurid west, beautiful the white radiance, that dissolves all. What recognition, from what deep source cries glory to the, ev to the universal light that walks the ever-running waves? What memory deeper than fear? What recollection of untrammeled joy our scattered falling drops retain of gleaming ocean's unending play? going backwards again. This is from poems from the Lost Country, 1971. This is really an occasional poem. It's not very serious, except that it will serve as light relief. It's about, it's called A Painting by Winifred Nicholson, who was uh, my friend for many years and a very beautiful painter. She lived in Cumberland and was a the reference to the daughter of the castle. She was one of the uh, Howards of, of um, Lanacost and the reference to the school teacher's daughter was to me. Sunlit green of a late summer hayfield the pikes all led and their faint circles faded, sheltered by abundant beach, goldening to autumn fire, and beyond soft English hills that close the view. Some happy hand has gathered sisters, bergamot, scabious, from the untidied, sheltered, brick-walled border, taken a jug from the flower room and put them just as they were, giving them a little shake to free their plumage by the window where a passing bee or butterfly may come. That is an old picture, my friend said, and I, how like the real world you and I remember. For those same peaceful fields of vanished summer were spread alike for ladies of the castle and for the niece of the village school teacher. Fields, it is true, in the aftermath are still green. Beaches turn brown. Country flowers in unheeded gardens grow. It is something else, we said, that will not come again. That leisure, that ease of heart unsevered from its roots, the things we thought about, some sweetness in the air, nuance of educated English speech, libraries, country lanes, few cars, 
wireless, a cat's whisker, and a piece of quartz boys fiddled with. But there was laughter, songs at the piano, the golden bow, the spirit of man, pressed flowers. How fondly we took civilization for granted. Then this is called By the River Eden, and there are three poems uh, about the River Eden in Cumbria, where my mother uh, lived as a child, and to which I later used to return. Never twice that river, though the still turning water in its dark pools mirrors suspended green of an unchanging scene. Frail bubbles revolve, break in the rippling falls, the same I could believe, each with its moment gone, I watched in former years. Ever reforming maze of evening midges dance, swift their chase and scream, touching in their low flight the picture on the stream. Heart is deceived, or knows what mind ignores. Not the mirroring flux, nor mirroring scene remain, nor the rocky bed of the river's course, but shadows intangible that fade and come again. Through their enduring forms, the glossy river runs. All flows, save the image cast on that shimmering screen. And then the second part. Beside the river Eden, some child has made her secret garden on an alder strand, marked out with pebbles on the sand, patterned with meadow flowers, as once I did and was. My mother, who from time past, recalls the red spots on the yellow mimulus that nodded in the burn to her alone was that same child, and hers, bedridden, mused on an old, cracked, darkened picture of a salmon river, painted in paradise so long ago, none living ever saw those tumbling waters flow, by her imagination made miraculous, water of life poured over its faded, varnished stones. All is one, I or another, she was I, she was my mother, the same child forever, building the same green bower by the same river. And then the third. The lapwing's wavering flight warns me from her nest, her wild sanctuary. Dark wings, white breast. The nine nicks have weathered, lich and stab, slabs tumbled in sand under roots of time, bone and feather lie. The ceaseless wind has blown. But over my gray head, the plover's unaging cry. Then three poems. called The Return, well, no, this poem is called The Return, the other one. I have come back to ancient shores where it is always now, the beautiful troubled waters breaking over the skerry, on the wind in spindrift blown like lifting hair, clouds gathering over the summits of rum in the clear blue, are as they were when long ago I went my way in sorrow. Time, measure of absence, is not here in the wide present of the sky. Fleet, the broadcast light, is already returning, while we <coughs> who tell the hours and days by the beat of a heart can only depart after a vanishing radiance dragging mortal feet. But joy outspeeds light's wheel. The moments in their flight stays here in their flight stays here where in patterned strands the weed holds fast to the shore 
falls and lifts from ebb to flow of the unceasing tide that makes all things new and the curlews with immortal voices cry. And this is another poem about time and how really time is one continuous texture. There is no such thing in reality. April's new apple buds on an old lichened tree. Slender shadows quiver, celandines burn in the orchard grass. This moment's image, how long does a moment stay? I look and look away and look again and see the morning's light has changed a little, the linnet flow. But who can say when one moment's present become, became the next moment's past to which this now was still the yet to be? It seems in this old walled garden time does not pass, only mind wanders and returns. I watch attentively and see not one green blade move out of its place. The Easter daffodils, the shadows and the apple trees, phrases in music continuous from first to last. To be is to be always here and now. The green linnet flits from bough to bough. <coughs> Paradise Garden is always there, it's we who aren't always there. This is <coughs> I didn't think it has a time. I felt under my old breasts this April day, young breasts, like leaf and flower to come under grey apple buds, and heard a young girl within me say, let me be free of this winter bark, this toil-worn body, I who am young, my form subtle as a dream. And I replied, you, who are I, entered a sad house when you put on my clay, this shabby menial self and lifelong time Bear with as you may, until your ripening joy put off the dust and ashes that I am, like winter scales cast from a living tree. Then, this poem is called The Dead. Not because they are far, but because so near the dead seem strange to us. Stripped of those unprized familiar forms they wore, defending from our power to wound that poignant naked thing they were, the holy souls speak essence to essence, heart to heart. Scarcely can we dare to know in such intimacy those whom courtesy or reticence or fear hid when, covered in skins of beasts evading and evaded, we turn the faces of our souls away. Only the youngest child is as near as they, or those who share the marriage bed when pity and tenderness dwell there. Then this is a poem um, The sense of the muse is very well known to men who write verse and I too have always been aware of the presence of the muse but in the form of a, of a youth 
of, of the poor Eternus, as it were. And uh, it has been a continually accompanying sense of this other um, mind that writes my poetry. You can call it, if you like, the, the unconscious or anything you like. It doesn't really matter what you call it, except that the sense of that presence is of a person, not of uh, an abstraction, as the collective unconscious sounds of theoretical, but one has a sense of a personal presence, I think, very much. A living presence, should I say. Long ago I thought you young, bright diamond, whisperer in my ear of springs of water, leaves, and song of birds, by all time younger than I who from the day of my conception began to age into experience of pain. But now life in its cycle swings out of time again. I see how old you were, older by eternity than I, who my hair gray, eyes dim with reading books, can never fathom those grave deep memories whose messenger you are. Day spring to the young, and to the old, ancient of days. I wanted a poem I could call introspection, is that right? If you go deep into the heart, what do you find there? Fear, fear, fear of the jaws of the rock. Fear of the teeth and splinters of iron that tear flesh from the bone and the moist blood running unfelt from the wound and the hand suddenly moist and red. If you go deep into the heart, what do you find? Grief, grief, grief for the life unlived, for the loves unloved, for the child never now to be born the unbidden anguish when the fair moon rises over still summer seas and the pain of sunlight scattered in vain on spring grass. If you go deeper into the heart, what do you find there? Death, death, death that lets all go by, lets the blood flow from the wound, lets the night pass, endures the day with indifference, knowing that all must end. Sorrow is not forever, and sense endures no extremities. Death is the last secret implicit within you, the hidden, the deepest knowledge of all you will ever unfold in this body of earth. I wonder. And then I think we asked for, I read the return, didn't I? Yes. And the marriage of Psyche, page 66. We were talking in the car on the way back yeah. from Birmingham about Claude Lorraine and a famous painting of his called The Enchanted Castle, which I think recently was on exhibition at the National Gallery where it is. There was a very fine lecture on videotape accompanying it, which traces the supposed setting of the picture to Psyche outside Cupid's castle. And of course the house of Psyche is, is in Apollo's symbolism, it is the, the, the body, or if you like, this world. I think I'll read first a poem called <coughs> Present Day, which is really part of it. Passive I lie, looking up through leaves, an eye only, one of the eyes of earth that open at a myriad points at the living surface. Eyes that earth opens, see and delight, because of the leaves, because of the unfolding of the leaves, the folding, veining, imbrication, fluttering, resting, the green and deepening manifold of the leaves. Eyes of the earth know only delight, 
untroubled by anything that I am, and I am nothing. All that nature is we see and recognize, pleased with the sky, the falling water, and the flowers, with bird and fish and the striations of stone. Every natural form, living and moving, delights these eyes that are no longer mine, that open upon earth and sky, pure vision. Nature sees, sees itself, is both seer and seen. This is the divine repose that watches the ever-changing light and shadow, rock and sky and ocean. And then, Sankit Hub. In my love's house, there are hills and pastures carpeted with flowers. His roof is the blue sky, his lamp the evening star. The doors of his house are the winds and the rain his curtain. In his house are many mountains, each alone, and islands where the seabirds home. In my love's house, there is a waterfall that flows all night down from the mountain summit where the snow lies, white in the shimmering blue of everlasting summer, down from the high crag where the eagle flies. At his threshold, the tides of ocean rise, and the porpoise follows the shoals into still bays where starfish gleam on brown weed under still water. In sleep I was born here, and waking found rivers and waves my servants, sun and cloud and winds, bird messenger, messengers, and all the flocks of his hills and shoals of his seas. I rest in the heat of the day, in the light shadow of leaves and voices of air and water speak to me. All this he has given me, whose face I have never seen, but into whose all-enfolding arms I sink in sleep. Then some from Then I think to finish I perhaps read from a sequence of Italian poems. There's one to Demeter, the statue of Demeter, probably on the Capitolio, no, perhaps in the Vatican Museum, I can't remember. But she is the mother goddess who, in the Mistress of Eleusis, offers the uh, corn of this world's harvest and also the poppy is sacred to her, which is the uh, seed that brings forgetfulness. Her marble hand proffers to all who pass, ageless through time, an ear of ripened corn, and with the corn a heavy head of poppy. Her lips of stone impart a sacred silence that some have understood and none may break. She who is older than the rocks with her moon-silver sickle, these emblems culled of knowledge reaped, oblivion sown. Behold, a mystery shows, though not to all. The secret of the risen corn so elsewhere remembers, but here innumerable and small, her sacred poppy seed of moments, hours and days and months and years forgotten, and after these was shown another sign, obscured by blood, partly human, more sorrowful to contemplate than these of life in death, our pledge and gift from violated heaven. And this is called statues. They more than we are what we are, Serenity and joy we lost or never found, the forms of heart's desire. We gave them what we could not keep, we made them what we cannot be. Their kingdom is our dream, but who can say if they or we 
Our dream or dreamer, signet or clay. If the most perfect be most true, these faces pure, these bodies poised in thought, are substance of our form, and we the confused shadows part, cast. Growing towards their prime, they take our years away, and from our deaths they rise immortal in the life we lose. The gods consume us, but restore more than we were. We love that they may be, they are that we may know. Then this is, uh, I think I wrote the poem in Florence, I've been seeing the Fra Angelica in many, many churches in Rome and Florence and elsewhere, mostly Rome and Florence. And this is called Old Paintings on Italian Walls and it is really the Christian iconography here. And it is an image of man that in this reductive age it's well to remind ourselves of, I think, the maximal, maximal image of humanity rather than the minimal that was so flowered in Italian art. Who could have thought that men and women could feel with consciousness so delicate, such tender, secret joy? With fingertips of touch as fine as music, they greet one another on vials of painted gold, attuned to harmonies of world with world. They sense with inward look and breath withheld the stir of invisible presences upon the threshold of the human heart alighting. Angels winged with air, with transparent light, Archangels with wings of fire and faces veiled. Their eyes gleam with wisdom radiant from an invisible sun. Others contemplate the mysteries of sorrow. Some have carried the stigmata, themselves icons depicting a passion. No man as man can know, we being ignorant of what we do. And painted wounded hands are by the same knowledge formed beyond the ragged ache that flesh can bear and we with blunted mind and senses dulled endure Giotto's compassionate eyes wrapped in sympathy of grief see the soul's wounds that hate has given to love and those which love must bear with the spirit that suffers always and everywhere those painted shapes, still in perpetual adoration, behold invisible form, invisible essences that hold our gaze, they hold their gaze entranced through centuries, and we, in true miraculous icons, may see still what they see, though the sacred lineaments grow faint, the outlines crumble and the golden heavens grow dim where the pantocrator shows in vain wounds once held precious. Paint and stone will not hold them to our world when those who once cast their bright shadows on these walls have faded from our ken, we from their knowledge fallen. And this is called The Eternal Child, and is again Italy. Of course, the Christian, Christ Child, the Holy Innocence, and also the pre-Christian Eros, the Child God with his torch burning upright, and Anteros, death with the inverted torch. You see so many of these beautiful representations of the, the eternal child of all times. A little child enters by a secret door alone, was not and is, carrying his torch aflame. In pilgrim cloak and hood many and many come, or is it the one child again 
and again. What journey do they go, what quest accomplish, task fulfill, whence they cannot say, whither we cannot tell, and yet the way they know. So many innocent reflections in a torrent throne, can any on these treacherous waters cast, unmarred, unbroken, image the perfect one? All things seem possible to the newborn, but each one's story tells, one dream leaves on the threshold of unbounded night, where all return, spent torch and pilgrim shroud. Then this is a sort of reflection on the way that imaginative images come, as it were, descending the <coughs> Jacob's ladder from the inner worlds, the inner heavens of the imagination, and seem to return. They can't stay, as I said, these wonderful images cast on the walls of churches. They perish like that wonderful film of Tarkovsky's film of Rublia, having painted these icons, they're unpainted again by time, but more always come, and therein I think lies our hope. We do not see them come, their great wings furled, their boundless forms enfolded, smaller than poppy seed or grain of corn, to enter the dimensions of our world in time to unfold what in eternity they are, each a great sun but dwindled to a star by the distances they have travelled. Higher than cupola their bright ingress, presences vaster than the vault of night, incorporeal mental spaces infinite, diminished to a point and to a moment brought through the everywhere and nowhere invisible door by the many ways they know the thoughts of wisdom pass in seed that drifts in air or in the water's flow they come to us down ages long as dreams or instantaneous as delight. As from seed, tree, flower and fruit grow and fade like a dissolving cloud or as the impress of the wind makes waves and ripples spread they move unseen across our times and spaces. We try to hold them, trace on the walls of cave, cave temple or monastic cell, their shadows cast. Animal forms, warriors, dancers, winged angels, words of power on precious leaves inscribed in gold or lapis lazuli, or arabesques in likeness of the ever-flowing. They show us gardens of paradise, holy mountains, where water of life springs from rock or lion's mouth, walk with us unseen, put into our hands emblems, an ear of corn, pine cone, lotus, looking glass or chalice, as dolphin, peacock, hare or moth or serpent show themselves, or human form, a veiled bride, a boy bearing a torch, shrouded or robed or crowned, four-faced, sounding lyre or sistrum, or crying in bird voices. Water and dust and light reflect their images as they slowly come and swiftly pass. We do not see them go from visible into invisible like gossamer in the sun. Bodies by spirit raised fall as dust to dust when the wind drops, moth wing and chrysalis. Those who live us and outlive us do not stay, but leave empty their semblances, icons, bodies of long enduring gold, or the fleet golden flower on which the Buddha smiled. In vain we look for them where others found them, for by the vanishing stare of time, immortals are forever departed. But while we gaze after the receiving vision, Others are already descending through gates of ivory and horn. 
One could call it a love poem, and it's um, the gift is a. I notice that people nowadays, when they give one another some sacred gift, it's usually a twig or a leaf or a stone or a shell or a, a fossil. Um, I have quite a collection now stones from rivers in America. Uh, of stone from Avila, autumn leaves from New England, uh, pebbles from all over the world, and fossils. And I think they are for us what corresponds to the sacred in other ages, or perhaps these things that are for us naturally sacred, coming from Earth itself. And this was a very precious gift to me. Um, one of those stones that come up from under the low tide water with uh, worm casts on, you know, white scrolls of some marine worm. Your gift to me was a grey stone cast upon a wild shore, traced over with calligraphy of inscrutable life, a marine annelid with stroke as free as by master brush one fluent word has written with its life in the record of the Logos, yet lacked senses to see its delicate coils and meanders of white masonry. Mind unknown that blind chasm signed with weight and drift of sea of wave refracted light and stress of spirit omnipresent in every part, universal being here imprinted. The number-loving Greeks built their white temples to Apollo of the Measured and Aphrodite, the veiled source. Does the same harmony inform those marble shells, the word that is and means always and everywhere the same? Your message of life to life was written on the seafloor before we were serpentine, strange and clear, the deep knowledge we share, who are not the knowers but the known. You gave and I received as beauty what the Logos writes, intelligible, though not to us, the inscription on the stone. And finally, oracles. From their grave lion mouths, oracles with angel tongues outpour continuous the silent flood of time. But we who cannot stem but are that flow know only that we fall and fall from source to abyss forever. Their serene wisdom is the book of life we write in blood and ignorance who are incomprehensible utterance of masks of dream. Perhaps, perhaps that's enough. You might prefer to ask some questions. Of Rose, did you prefer the poems you read more recently? Or do you go back? Yes, sometimes I do. I think finally we all only have one thing to say. And um, it's. Uh, I don't think we get better and better necessarily as we grow older, although I think we perhaps have more control of what we want to say as we grow older doesn't change. The vision, I think, is essentially the same, but but one explores it and widens it and deepens it and knows how to do it. Um, but then again, there are moments. There are inspired moments, I think. There are ups and downs. But um, I think as one gets older, one doesn't 
depend on emotion at all. That's a difference, I think. You don't need the stimulus of emotion to open the eye of the imagination. When you're young, I think you do work on a kind of emotional impulse. But I don't know that all men do. There's this young poet called Jeremy Reed, who's only 23. I think he's going to be a great, he is a great poet. He won't write better than he's writing now. And although he has no doubt a troubled life, it's completely impersonal. It's as if it is just given him and he writes it. He's a recorder of this other mind that one does contact from time to time. It's a great mystery, I don't know. It's extraordinary that you say that because we were discussing earlier this afternoon at Birmingham certain analogies with music and this is very true again of Mozart. You know, he'll say in his letter, you know, this morning I heard that my mother had died. So I sat down and finished my string quartet. And it came, the musical composition came untroubled and straight, mm -hmm. despite what one takes to be some personal turbulence. I think this is so. But then Mozart was, he <laughs> was a f the most pure example ever of this thing of inspiration, wasn't it? Yes. There's never been anyone who was more aware of it. I suppose among poets one would say someone like Dante. Um, there's a very good book by a man called William Anderson about called Dante the Maker. Apparently he had an overwhelming vision when he was relatively young and he saw the whole poem he was going to write. And he wrote it. This great structured work came out of this sort of fountain of of, of one clear perception of what it was, rather like Mozart. It creates a, some sort of problem. I mean, Mozart is interesting um, in that it's taken by many to make him rather cold, you know, this sort of gift or ability goes on manifesting itself, really, wherever he is and whatever he's doing, and it becomes difficult for him to actually understand that it's not the same for other people. You know, he says, I. I set Miss X five variations to write on a theme last week, and she can't do it. You know, <laughs> it's in blank incomprehension. Mm. I think that it ought to be understood that true poets, and I'm only one occasionally, but I do know, I do know some. I have known real poets in my life, like Saint Jean Perse, like Vernon Watkins, like I must say Edwin Muir. I never knew Yeats. But that inspiration is a real thing. It does come from somewhere else. People who write about their personal feelings uh, just aren't there, you know. They aren't there. Sometimes personal feeling will help you through, but more often it, it entirely blocks this, this flow of, 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 of vision. It comes from another world, and because it, belo it is not personal, therefore it speaks to everyone. It is true of everyone. You see Mozart we feel in a curious way that we could have written it ourselves. We don't feel how different Mozart is from us, or what an interesting insight into the 18th century. We feel, yes, we just go with it. It speaks for us as well as to us. And a poet, for example, like Auden, well, it's going to need an awful lot of footnotes in um, 50 years' time, you know, who was mad Nijinsky and what did he say to Diaghilev and all this sort of thing. These things that seem to speak to the, uh, a, a shared language at a given moment are the very things that become obscure 50 years later, whereas uh, Shakespeare, again, one feels, well, how did he know? Of course I know that, but how did Shakespeare know, you know? <laughs> and and this, there's a sense in great poetry or great art of any kind that we could have done it. It's quite absurd. Of course, we probably couldn't. But nevertheless, there's an assent. Our whole humanity says yes to it because it is something common to the human imagination and not particular to Mr. X, Y, and Z or Miss A, B, or C. Uh, it's, it's, it's a common, universal um, inner knowledge that communicates. And so in imaginative poetry, the poet is not telling you about himself, he's telling you about yourself. 
He's telling all of us about our own deeper selves. And this, it seems to me, is a true function of the arts, that they do awaken this response, the sleeping, uh, you know, the, 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 the Hellenistic world didn't talk about original sin, it talked about forgetfulness. The soul comes into this world and it forgets eternity. Well, that may only be a symbol, but the fact is that we all are aware of there's something we can't quite get, reach, and we long for it. And a great work of art, we say, oh yes, that's it. And it gives us to ourselves, it gives our whole selves, it enables us to become our, our own Selves, whereas it doesn't help anyone to become anything. The sort of uh, thing that um, I won't name any names, why should I? <laughs> There's so much of nowadays in which people are simply anecdotal or telling about their neuroses or something or other, but they're not giving this um, likeness of, 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 of the human spirit by which we live. And, and which is given us by Bach, by Mozart, by Schubert, by Shakespeare, by Shelley, by Yeats, and by many lesser poets indeed. I think that uh, Edwin Muir, Vernon Watkins, David Gascoigne, and as I say, I think young Jeremy Reed has it. And uh, I can think of rather few others at this time, but maybe I've forgotten someone. I rather like Peter Redgrove's poetry, though I think his novels are terrible. <laughs> Can I ask you, you mentioned Yeats a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are anecdotes of Yeats laboring for days to get a line out. Oh, he did. Do you, do you find yourself that, um, I mean, once you have a vision <coughs> or that sense of being in touch with you know, the imagination, does the actual writing of the poetry come easily, or does that take? Mm. Not at all easily, no. Very seldom. Just occasionally one is given. As Blake said, you know, I've written a poem <coughs> by dictation, 40 or 50 lines at a time, all without labor or study. Well, he'd done the labor or study in the previous 20 years, you see, and it came out beautifully. I think perhaps there are great poets for whom it does come easily. It came easily to Shelley. Um, Yeats, not at all. I think this 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 differs, and I don't believe Dante ever hesitated. Do you think he just wrote it? You know, um, but not with a blank mind and not oh out no. of ignorance. Not at all with a blank mind or that of ignorance. He too had done the labour or study. <laughs> it, it, the textbook, hadn't he? Really? It, well, you see, you can't write poetry out of out of nothing at all. You need to. But I'm, I think there are poets who can write and that it does flow. I'm not one of them. You say you come to depend less on less on emotion. Mm -hmm. Is there a way in which instead of emotion you come to depend much more on me? I was kind of conscious reaching out to you about the uh, that which is common. Um, well, of course, um, in my own case, I know a lot about myth because it's been a subject I've been immersed in through my Blake studies for many years. But no, that has nothing to do with it. I think you, when you're older, you, 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 um, <laughs> yourself isn't so much in the way of your imagination, if I can put it so. Your, your own personal problems become really minimal, they're non-existent, or your own, uh, you almost don't see personally anymore, you see in a more, uh, well, as King Lear said, you know, as if you were God's spies. I think that is a wonderful thing, you know. God's spies, that's how it is to be old, I think. So I wonder whether the greater role would be no, I think I cut out an awful lot of cleverness as I grew older. You know, when the myth is, one has lived and experienced, and one knows the, the sort of uh, ground of the myth, so that the myths, as it were, out of books, um, 
they have been once known at a certain time and forgotten them again. But the, the, the myth has become an experience, if you like. Um, you can read a myth when you're young, you don't know what it, what it corresponds to in real life, and you can write very clever undergraduate poetry from it. But uh, a myth is true because it corresponds to life. And as you grow older, you've lived your way through these things until they become uh, something else. Of course, Yeats was immensely learned in all that too. And he, as it were, had eaten and digested and absorbed an immense body of, of, of knowledge which informs with apparent effortlessness his, his work more and more as he grew older. Uh, he used simpler and simpler language for more and more profound ideas. Um, so in a way, the, it, it is all interiorized and, and lived and experienced. Could I put that question in a slightly different way because it's something that interests me. I mean, it's often said that myths are never either true or false. They are simply either living or dead. Now, if one has spent a good deal of one's life um, living uh, with and amidst mythology and myths, they are part of one's mental furniture, as it were, and therefore they are real in the way that in past ages they were very, very real and very much more close to the consciousness of many people. Whereas what is, I think, true today is that all that is very remote or not even very accessible to very large numbers of people. Whereas you, through the fact of your studies, have in fact had all this in your mind and been able to draw on it. Well, the poet ought to be able to give back uh, the, the re-digest and re-give re, uh, back the meaning latent in the myths as, as Yeats did in the poetry. The poetry should be able to reanimate and give as experience to people who perhaps haven't read uh, Plutarch, you see. You don't want to give them Plutarch to read, but in the, in the myth of Leda and the Swan, poet Yeats' Leda and the Swan, the whole thing becomes living, self-explanatory. It's about history, it's about the relation of the, of the unseen to, the, to, the, to this, this frontier that fascinated Yeats between the visible and the invisible worlds. And you don't really need to uh, look it up in a classical dictionary because it's in the poem. And, and that is what poetry should do. It should recreate, reanimate the, the living themes. It, they're called archetypes nowadays. You know, Jung calls them archetypes. Some people find that an easier word than myths. Um, but they're always there. They are permanent realities of the imagination. Uh, they're not permanent realities of the physical world. And of course, we've con been so conditioned to regard the only reality as external, measurable, quantifiable, physical reality. But if you begin to rediscover the inner world of the imagination, or if you like, the psyche, all these things that have no particular meaning in terms of quantitative science, one sees, one sees, oh yes, that's what it's about. You see, for a hundred years, no one knew what Blake was talking about when he wrote about the four zoas and so on. It presents no problem to the 20th century uh, because we have begun to re-examine the, the actual structure of, of the human imagination, which is real, it's always real, but to the 19th century, it was curiously, uh, they weren't aware of it. I think in our century, we are, again, becoming aware of our inner worlds as a structured universe. I don't mean structuralism, of course. Although even that has a certain meaning. And I think a great deal of bad verse and bad painting and bad art is being produced at the present time, which is a sort of hangover from, uh, from a mechanistic view of the universe, which regards the physical material world as the only thing, and is terribly devoid of, 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 of inner meaning. Um, 
it, it cripples the poets terribly to be uh, trying to relate to this obsolete model of the universe because it is an obsolete model. The, 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 the Newtonian post-Cartesian mechanism is no longer viable in terms of science, but many people still continue to be conditioned by it and therefore to uh, not to listen to the to the inspirers who come from within whatever that means from the imagination it all has to be re rediscovered recreated and i think is being so and will be so though we haven't got a mozart at the moment i think with prophetic knowledge of a living spirit that uh, is known to poets and artists as well as to uh, or as Yeats there says or be content to live our thought because a life can be lived by this inner inspiration too it's, uh, it's just as true of those who don't write poetry as those who do but of course in a secular context it has no meaning at all but then the arts perish in a secular context. The arts have always been associated in some mode or other with whatever at that time humanity regarded as being sacred. And in a way, the sacred is an experience. Again, you can't, as it were, believe in the sacred or know about it. You can only experience it. It's silly to say I do or don't believe that things are sacred because it is this vision, it is this experience, which is in itself um, self-validating, it just is, and that is the inspiration, or art, that is imaginative art. It's not true, of course, of political verse, or comic verse, or many things that can be very amusing and <coughs> pleasurable but not the central thing for which alone, which the arts alone can do, which is speak to the human imagination. There is no other language for the human imagination except the arts. You can write comic verse or comic prose, you can do journalism reporting in verse if you wish to do so, but there is no other mode of imaginative creation except the art. Do you find that, that you can put yourself in the way of this experience? Um, or do you just have to wait for it? Oh, you don't. If you waited, you'd wait forever. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is to get out a clean sheet of paper and a biro and open yourself and work. It's quite hard work. Of course, I've spent the greater part of my life on scholarship, not on writing verse. I might have been a better poet if I'd worked, if I'd got out that sheet of paper more often. But no, you don't wait for inspiration. You can't do it that way. as when you discovered it in Florence, where it was it discovered it in a lot of Hellenic um, religion? I mean, is there an interaction that is necessary? Yes, there is, of course. But in looking at paintings isn't exactly scholarship, is it? It's, it's living, it's, it's experiencing, it's receiving the imaginative communication of the work of other artists and you look at a Chinese painting it isn't scholarship it speaks immediately to the imagination and uh, you see there's a learning of the imagination that is not exactly scholarship but it is having experienced a great deal of the art and the creative uh, what man has made we have all this at our disposal and uh, it speaks immediately to the imagination 
it doesn't, as it were, come through the laborious process of scholarship. Very many poets and painters are. They know as much as the academics know, but they know it in a different way, I think, you see? Because scholars can work away uh, like computers, perhaps. I don't say they do, but they, it, it is conceivable, and some almost do, without ever experiencing what is communicated in that work. They can make a sort of index or something. But the imaginative experience of the work is how the, what the author of that work hopes is going to take place. Poetry, Dante or Shakespeare or whoever it may be, they don't write so that scholars can write theses on them, which is something I think in the universities is often forgotten. One writes so that living human beings may receive the message, the communication, the, the vision, the living, the living experience. But nonetheless, isn't it true that in order to receive the living experience, you have to have put in your hands, or have in your hands, the keys to unlock the doors? When I look at uh, some of Dürer's engravings, for instance, or even more difficult, some of Bosch, his paintings, now, there's all sorts of messages waiting to be communicated mm. to me there, but I'm not able to receive them because I can't decode them or I haven't the keys in my hands to unlock them. And I'm sure very many people already feel this even about some of T.S. Eliot's writings. And certainly, you know, a little bit further on in the future, the, the keys yes. will cease to be there. And you've got to therefore have, um, not necessarily just through scholarship, but the, the means to receive the whatever the work of art has to convey to you. And very many people very many of us very quickly don't. Well, this is what I've been spending a lifetime trying to point out about Blake and about modern criticism, that if you are trying to read <coughs> a poet or look at a painter or an architect, as it were, from different premises in this culture, materialist culture, what Yeats calls the three provincial centuries, uh, you cannot decode Shelley, Blake. I mean, look at the things that Levis writes about Blake or Shelley or so. He is not using the right key. I think the only poetry you can read uh, without having knowledge of that is contemporary work, where the suppositions of the writer are the same as the uh, reader. Otherwise, you do have to do some work. But once, for example, the universal and unanimous tradition of the perennial philosophy is worldwide. And once you have got one idiom of the language, as it were, say, Neoplatonism, there is no problem whatever in reading uh, another dialect of that language, say, the Indian or, or Sufi poetry, because the, the premises, basically, and the view of what man is and what the universe is, are the same. It is we who are provincial. It is we who are exceptional. One has no difficulty in looking at a Chinese painting or uh, listening to uh, or, or Japanese haiku uh, because these are all, um, as it were, dialectic variations of a single view of man and the universe, whereas modern Western materialism is aberrant. And it is we who have lost the key to a great universe of um, art or what it's trying to communicate. And we won't find the key by scholarship entirely either. It's, um, it's a change of premises that is required in order to put oneself in a situation to receive, for example, Shelley's poetry, even, or Coleridge, or, or uh, one can get some bit of Wordsworth, some bit of Byron, practical nothing of Blake. Um, it's a very subtle matter. Do you think there's... No redemption. Oh, 
what I think modern man is, is what man has always been. And, and man being always human will never be satisfied with um, anything less than corresponds to the stature of what we in fact and for all time are. And there must be an immense dissatisfaction with the kind of reductionist view of man that is current at the present time in the modern West. And of course people won't stay with it. They've been insist in some way of getting back to what I, I would call the norm, which is a different view of man. And after all, we've had Yeats in our own century. We have, who else have we had? Many, surely, Paul Williams, Elliot, if you like, Edwin Will, um, Saint Jean Pers, uh, Miloche. Uh, um, it, it exists, and I think it's, it's bound always to. But Tess said it was the most marvelous chronicler of the wasteland we're in, you know. Oh, right? yes. So was Dante. <laughs> You know, it isn't that the spiritually minded only see heaven, not at all, but they see the, the, the human situation and the hells in different terms. Or Dostoevsky, he could describe the hells, but he didn't present it as many modern writers do, saying, look, this is reality, this is it, this is where we are, this is all there is. He had it in a context, as Dante had, as Tears in it. And uh, the context is what has been lost. And people just scream and say, this is life. <laughs> oh, are we swamped with images? Uh, too much music and art, too much to read and to read productions and painting? Or do you think this is not an obstacle? Well, it is, of course. But more than that is the kind of what a distinction you see. You see, say, on the television, you see something marvellous. Then the next minute you have an advertisement, then you have the news, then you have um, a comic turn. And so that everything is, as it were, reduced to one level. Good, bad, and indifferent. And this, I think, is very bad. And you may say it's simply too much, but it's, it's too, um, uh, what's the word? too much of a mixture of everything so that in effect everything ends by being negated and we look at the war in the Falklands or we look at explosions in Israel and it's just another explosion on the telly screen so that we lose the capacity for giving an adequate and valid response to any of the multitude of things we're shown. We say oh how dreadful and ten minutes later we're looking for something quite different you see. So that we don't really deeply experience, we have a wide range of sensations, but they all cancel each other, wouldn't you say? Not always. Uh, I mean, you can see, uh, even on the developed television screen, which is as good as cinema, you know, the great film, it's just you know, 1200 now or something, and it will, you won't want to see any more out of that anyway, I mean, it will fix images in your mind instead. Well, one hopes so, doesn't one? But, it, it, but it, to a great many people, to the majority almost, uh, I think they would just leave it on and let the next thing come and say that was a good film last night and the day after tomorrow they would go. Poetry conveys, I thought, a tremendous sensitivity to nature. Uh, and yes. to nature as process. Um, and I wonder if you've got any tension between that sensitivity, which you can so beautifully about um, the other side of the order, which is the sense of eternity beyond nature, or whether you, you do, in fact, look at nature as a kind of heightened level of eternity, even when you most see it, you want to be shown you, or tumble, or Well, I, I, I do think the whole thing is one thing. I don't know that. Uh, eternity is beyond or after nature. It, it, nature is the mirror of eternity. You see, what was wrong about the, the post-Cartesian world is it, that it tore apart the experiencing mind and the object of knowledge, which became a mechanized 
became a machine, as the watch, the, the mechanism of nature, what they called the dark satanic mills, so that mind and nature were torn apart. But in fact, what we experience, and modern science would say so now, can't distinguish between the experiencing mind and this marvelous spectacle of nature, Maya. Um, the outer and inner are really one, and and poetry is, at certain moments, one has this realization and tries to say it in the poem. You see, there is a lot of poetry written in the 19th century that merely describes nature, often very beautifully, but it is describing something out there. But I think in my kind of poetry, what I hope it does at its best is to give the, the unity of the experience and the thing experienced so that nature becomes a perpetual, uh, ever-flowing vision which we experience. And it is no longer a dead object. It is a, it is a living... Uh, it's an image of... of Well, traditionally there are four worlds, aren't there? You know, the, and and we live in a sort of one horizontal world. But I am a monist. I, I don't make a distinction. I find the kind of thing I'm trying to say very beautifully said in Far Eastern poetry, in in haiku. You know. So the middle poems was actually persuasion rather than projections of the world, direct Yes. One hopes it gives the experience because the way to, to uh, imaginative knowledge is always an experience and a work of art should give the experience. One shouldn't have to have a whole lot of extraneous things um, and sometimes the poem can, as it were, open all sorts of metaphysical th things out of it. It doesn't necessarily happen that you have to have metaphysics first and then the poem. In fact, I would imagine that most great civilizations began with a vision and then became, as it were, structured later. The, the, the vision is, is, is primary. like to think that any of them were. I would like to think they were, but one isn't always achieving what one would wish. And some are more acts of persuasion. Sometimes, I hope and believe, just now and again, one has got it, you know, so that you don't have to make that kind of distinction. Because I think that is what uh, one would wish to have, that, they, that you couldn't take it apart. Say, this is what she's trying to say and this is how she puts it. <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. It should. It should. But I'm, I'm not a, I'm not pleading for my own uh, work at all. I'm not saying, you know, this is what I do and how splendid. I'm saying what I feel that poetry should be and all of us who try to, to do it uh, it's like playing the piano. You may do it very badly, but at least you're trying. And uh, was it you who was saying earlier, um, Teresa, about how marvelously children sometimes write poetry? And I too have seen children's poems, and they they have this natural power of experiencing the world imaginatively, and later we most of us appear to lose it. And whether that's the fault of education or just the fault of growing up, I don't know. But whereas Wordsworth talks about the loss of vision as we grow up, Blake talks continually about having made his way back to the paradisal vision. He says, to me, this world is one continuous uh, 
vision of fancy or imagination. Uh, he, he, he had regained this capacity for experiencing it in the imaginative way which Wordsworth, I think, has left it as a kind of orthodoxy almost, that they have this vision. He, he wrote such a wonderful poem about the loss of vision that people believe that it's inevitable, but that was only his own unfortunate experience. And Oh yes, I have written the poems that she didn't write. Yeah. She was the poet, <laughs> and I think from my babyhood she rather wished it on me, if you like. Um, she wrote down my infant poems. She gave me poetry to read. She she was poetry. She her her life was was imaginative. She lived in the imagination all the time. But she never wrote. That generation didn't. She didn't think of writing, and I dare say she couldn't have written. But she experienced life imaginatively. My father was quite different. He was a scholar and a moralist. But my mother was to me, uh, now I look back on it, I didn't think so at the time. I was horrible to her in many ways for years. But she was just that. She was someone who lived in the imagination, always. I have met other people, but she had it totally, almost. I think this was a, a Scottish train. <laughs> I think it was in part. I think that, uh, yes, I think it was in a way a Scottish train, but I think it was also a personal gift. Yes, a mode of being, which was, in a sense, fostered and protected by the, the sort of peasant Scottish culture in which they're not afraid to, to laugh or weep and the, or to love and, and the poetry of the love poetry, the poetry of tragedy. You know, you find in Scotland people are quite prepared to weep uh, about when they hear... I remember on the Isle of Lewis, Margaret Campbell's old friends, Maggie, Mary and Peggy McCray, who knew hundreds and hundreds of Gaelic songs. And one of the old sisters, she must be well over 80 at the time, sang one song. And it was about a young sailor who'd sailed away from the Isles and had left his true love. And a very simple theme, very basic. And the other sister burst into tears because of the song, because it was an entirely, she experienced the, the, this thing imaginatively. In a way, it's an art, a peasant art. It's come out of life, and it speaks back to people who are in that life. It is a perfect example of a, a world of art that works on a very simple basis. Uh, it, it corresponds to their very simple range of experiences, if you like, birth, marriage, and death in a particular landscape. And it speaks to them. In fact, it's a culture that's working, it's alive. Our more complex English culture is, is uh, much more rich in some ways, but it doesn't work so immediately and infallibly. You've probably seen that yourself in your country. They are more whole people, I think, peasant people, the world over. I have only met, I've met American Indians, and I know Scotland, and I knew my own peasant roots in Northumberland when England was much closer to these things. And although it's a much simpler way of life, it's, it's a more complete one. You know, Jung talks about man being fourfold, and there is more wholeness in that world of people, although they're not so specialized intellectually as we are.
And it's, it's very beautiful to complicated people like myself who have this kind of nostalgia for something we want any longer and never can be. That I think applies to most of us. We'd love to be simple, but we aren't. I know rather little about um, Blade, but something you said earlier um, immediately struck me as, as, as true, that Blake, in a way, spent his life going back, um, not just for going back, regaining an ever greater power and uh, insight, um, access to something which perhaps he'd started off with fairly limited access to. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see that as sort of modern man in a very uh, secular, scientific, materialist society, that, there, that he can't just go on going forward, as it were, but something has got to be unraveled and reintegrated for him to ad advance? Yes, advance. it has. But Blake was, <coughs> after all, our one national prophet, and he saw exactly what was wrong with them, with with the English nation to which his poetry is addressed. He wasn't writing the private language for a few people, an elite, uh, uh, the society, the Ro uh, you know, Rosie Rubia and Aria Cruces, nothing like that. To the public, Blake said. He was speaking to the nation. And he was speaking to the nation because he felt himself to be a prophet who could diagnose, who saw absolutely clearly what was happening to the English nation coming under the power of Bacon, Newton, and Locke, as he put it, the post-Cartesian view of the wrenching apart of nature from consciousness. And he arrived at a view of man through Barclay and uh, the uh, Neoplatonists and uh, an excluded tradition of knowledge very close to the Vedantic view of nature as Maya, as as an experience of a living consciousness, you see. And uh, he had an extremely uh, analytical mind, and he, he knew full well what Locke had written, Descartes, and all of them. And he simply said, England must awaken from this mechanistic, uh, disease. He called it a deadly sickness of Albion, and the deadly sickness of Albion was uh, a materialist ideology. It's as simple as that. And it is an ideology that has now spread all over the world and just about reached its term because the, the, the physicists and the biologists have now totally uh, discredited this, this obsolete model of the universe that was given by by those particular philosophers at that particular time. And it, it is no longer applicable in, in scientific terms. People sort of say science has taught us, but it hasn't done anything of the kind. Science is somewhere quite different now, and many of the general public are still living in this obsolete uh, universe, which, as it were, cuts off the heart and the imagination from the rational mind and the natural universe. Blake diagnosed the whole thing absolutely perfect clarity. He didn't write with enough clarity, but uh, he had to reach here and there for his terms because the, the, the terminology was not available to him at that time and in that place. And so he borrowed from the Neoplatonists and the alchemists and on all hands to try to make this clear, I repeated it in form of myth and discursive speech in every way. I think now it's becoming fairly clear what he had to say, and there is, of course, a great following among the younger generation who regard Blake as a national prophet, which he was. And he's now all being translated into French. The French, the rational French, have discovered the imagination. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they've gone overboard about it much more than the English. If you, if you wish to hear about the imagination, go to France. Henri Corbin, Gilbert Durand, uh, Gaston Bachelard, um, and Pierre Léris is translating the whole works of Blake into French. Um, 
and then it sent for the, it sent for the aggregation this year. Blake would have been delighted. He, he loved the French too. It's, but Albion still seems to be lagging behind. Not altogether. So you don't see much um, light in the universities. You have two very devastating essays in your uh, The Inner Journey of the Poet on English departments and what goes on in terms of. Well, yeah, that's my function. <laughs> you know, that's my task. I too have my. Don't you have these delicious <coughs> oppositions? You see, you have rationalists and moralists over here, and you have those who have access to the imagination over there, and never the twain can meet. Well, it's time they did, of course. Um, but it is it is my task to be Blake's secretary and to try to clarify what this great prophet of the imagination was trying to tell us because the imagination is life itself it is the living spirit uh, by which we live in which we are and um, it isn't that reason is one thing imagination is another and feeling something else Blake was saying perpetually imagination is the human existence itself he called it the divine body in every man, the divine humanity. He identified it with Jesus, Jesus, the imagination. It is the living principle itself of which the four functions of reason, feeling, intuition, and sense are, as it were, the, the, uh, the faculties. Uh, in fact, it is primary, you see, whereas he said uh, Western Europe, and particularly England, has... Uh, put reason in the place of life and made reason as it were um, as Eurizen said I, now I am God from eternity to eternity and reason is not God from eternity to eternity um, life itself the prophetic spirit, the imagination is the living principle and reason can only build as it were on what imagination uh, experiences and of course ideally all the four functions should be working perfectly within one harmonious um, life it's a long way from that but wholeness is is something that means something nowadays I think much more than it did in terms of modern psychology or so what was your question? I, lost <laughs> I don't think I gave a question. Yeah, it was. Oh, about Blake, yes. Going forward, yes, for him it was an ever-expanding experience and not one like Wordsworth that was fading out. And Blake, of course, did accuse Wordsworth of, of becoming, of, of having taken over the, the kind of... Uh, Lockean, Newtonian, scientistic um, view of nature. And that was exactly what Blake criticized in Wordsworth, whom he admired enormously as a poet. But he, he, he turned pale when, he, I forget what he read in Wordsworth, he turned pale, but it was something on those lines. You see. It was li Wordsworth saying that nature was, nature be thou my goddess. That, no, that was Shakespeare, but it was virtually that. Wordsworth making a, a sort of idol of external nature and seeing man as part of nature instead of nature as being, as it were, part of man. And that was his quarrel with Wordsworth. It's extremely clear and coherent when one's seen it. Until you've seen it, it's incomprehensible. Well, on behalf of all of us, Kathleen, thank you very, very much for coming and sharing with us some of your own poetry that you read so beautifully, and then going on to share something of your thoughts about life. I'm afraid I didn't make it very clear. I'm sorry. But thank you for coming. <laughs>